There are various ways to pick bluffs from amongst your bluff catchers. If I had to ask you guys intuitively, which hand would you do it with? I think most guys would say, look to have the ace of diamonds. But I think that's a bit simplistic. Hey everyone, Uri for Gorilla Poker with another high stakes hand review. I want to take a second to mention before diving into the hand how much I appreciate all the comments and the feedback from everyone. Personally, I'm not exactly sure who my audience on YouTube is. That's just the nature of YouTube. It's hard to know. So these comments are kind of my, my main contact and feedback with you guys. I could really aim all of my videos at all sorts of different levels. I've worked with nosebleed players and micro stakes players and everything from, you know, recreational to, to super professional. So I really appreciate the feedback, positive comments, the trolley comments get, get laughs out of me sometimes when you guys don't hurt my feelings too much. Please keep them coming. They, they help me keep going. They help me kind of fine tune and understand what you guys do or don't like hearing. So for now, I'm going to keep doing more of these hand analysis reviews. I think they've gotten good feedback and try to aim them kind of where everyone can understand, but they also have some advanced concepts inside. So in this first hand, we're going to have a really cool hand, really huge pot between Isaac Haxton and uh, Victor Malinowski, two very well-known players. In terms of background, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure I would rate Isaac Haxton as a top modern six max player these days. Of course, he used to be, but I think he plays kind of super nosebleed games and MTTs and stuff like that. He's not really in the streets battling no limit hold him specifically necessarily. So while his fundamentals are good and obviously the guy's super smart, I would expect some theoretical mistakes. Victor, on the other hand, came up more recently and 6max is the game he came up in. I would actually expect him to be fairly technically sharp at 6max no limit. Although he's also kind of left into the... Kind of when you go to the super nosebleed realms, it, it, it becomes less about theory and more about the specific game and the specific players you're playing in. So sometimes you start falling behind, there's less motivation to, to work on a sharp theoretical game. So here we have the six-handed game uh, with antis and the straddle. And I glimpse from the small blind. Thornley uh, completes from the big blind, also a good rack. Victor Iso's big from the straddle. Now, uh, limping makes a ton of sense in these kind of structures with all the antis and all the dead money. You don't want to be doing these in lower stake games where the rake's much more of a factor. There are no antis, often there are no straddles, but in these high stakes games, this makes a lot of sense and it's part of proper strategy. We get the Iso, I calls and generally folds. And if you guys want to kind of imagine what ranges look like here, Victor is going to have a very polarized type of range. So he's going to have all his top hands and then a bunch of bluffs, where bluffs can be anything from 10-3 suited, king-7 offsuit, ace-4 offsuit. These are hands which, of course, you always have two cards, but they're not pushing any equity and they're mainly going for fold equity. And Ike is going to have only middle of the road. Like, his, his range is going to be a lot better defined, where he's going to have stuff probably like king-queen offsuit, jack-10 suited, pocket-7s. He's never going to have pocket kings, pocket aces, ace king. He's never going to have anything too weak because it's a big ISO and there's another player behind. Understanding the structure of these ranges helps you understand the strategies a lot more. So once you understand I can have this kind of middling condensed range and Victor has a polar range, you can look at the board, see who it's better for, kind of deduce what the, the strategies are probably going to be. And, and also play like barreling and bluff catching appropriately. So it's very, very important. Like I said, I've worked with tons of players. The best players that I've worked with, the most successful ones are just very, very sharp at recognizing ranges and textures and how things connect. So here we get a nine deuce three monotone board. And immediately you should be thinking, okay, Isaac Haxton could have deuces, threes and nines. The limitless is not going to have deuces and threes very often. And then there are no two pairs. This is very, very relevant. Both players can have a bunch of flushes, but the fact that it's monotone and the deuces and threes hits slightly devalues over pairs, not even slightly for Malinowski. And then kind of from experience, this kind of deuce three structure where deuce and three are cards that people very often just completely miss is almost like a nine blank blank structure in terms of how often ranges hit. And that means that Malinowski's kind of polarized range, the, the wide edges apart, gets to 
to do the kind of small block bet push the other guy out move which he's going to do here really tiny bet this is appropriate theoretically for monotone boards because on monotone boards both players have flushes so you don't want to start out with kind of huge bombing bets you don't really have a top range advantage you have even with your polarized range your aces kings queens you have a second tier range advantage so you're doing kind of an equity push type of play with a small bet so we have a bet i calls 32k on a pot hyper nosebleed turn deuce of spades goes check check deuce of spades again not many hands improving to trips in ike's range because he can't call ace deuce off or king deuce off only suited hands not even sure you can call something like king deuce suited preflop here so at this point, Malinowski can start barreling a bit bigger if he's barreling some flushes, presumably having already check raised, but goes check check. River King of Hearts and Ike checks, and Malinowski makes this kind of half potish bet where he's saying, you know, with this bet, probably have a king or a bluff or like pocket tens jack, like tens jacks queens and king x are, are similar in that they can all bet this kind of size. This puts Ike with a lot of his range in a bluff catching decision and if Ike's range is constructed correctly, he has some bluff catchers, maybe even some give ups. He's gonna mix calling and folding with the bluff catchers uh, and bluff raise some of them. And then he's gonna have some slow plays. Now, slow play depends on the context. Uh, of course, flushes are, are considered slow plays, but I think trip deuces could be considered a slow play here. Something like king three or king nine might be considered a slow play where it's good enough to check raise. So versus the size, uh, Ike goes all in three and a half times a pawn. And here the range, like I mentioned, is gonna be some bluffs, in, and there are various ways to pick bluffs from amongst your bluff catchers. Of course, every spot's a bit different, but let's let's look at kind of a, a BVB type of single raise pot. Similar board, and how do you pick these kind of check raise bluffs? If I had to ask you guys intuitively, which hand would you do it with? I think most guys would say, look to have the ace of diamonds. But I think that's a bit simplistic to do. Ace of Diamonds is not an important card in this context. It's not like Victor is going to call or fold based on whether or not he has a nut flush. Actually, he's just very rarely going to have the nut flush, and in that sense, the Ace of Diamonds is a fairly irrelevant card for check raise bluffing the river. I, I wouldn't look to have the Ace of Diamonds. I'm not even sure having a diamond, like which diamond you have, is that even important. What I, I would say is that generally uh, there are cards you want to not have in your hand. We have a video on the channel about blockers from back in the day. Now we talk about good blockers and bad blockers. You want to block the calling range and on block the folding range. And in this instance, it's not very clear what the calling range is going to be. Right? Victor's range is mostly is mixing calls with a king. Maybe wants to have a diamond kicker, so it's good to have a diamond. And that's it. Right? And, and then maybe a slightly high diamond. But, but which cards don't you want to have? And, and I think the cards you don't want to have would be unpaired non-diamonds. Right? Something like a 10 of clubs, 8 of spades, those kind of hands are probably bad. So intuitively the type of hand I would take is something like a 9 with a diamond. Maybe ace nine with a diamond and here like the preflop comes in I'd, I'd like to have a nine with a diamond i'm not sure these ranges specifically have them but let, let's take a look at the solver so just bvb similar spot we're gonna go one player goes bet call turn pairs the board it goes check check we get the king on the river we check villain makes a bet and there are some check raises don't care too much about the size but which type of hands are we looking to check raise bluff and you guys can see we're going for ace x with a diamond. We are not going for 9x because it's it's too strong. It gets to call. But we could go with something like ace 3. You could even go queen jack with a diamond. So here kind of the theorizing aside, I, I was thinking, you know, you want to have a diamond and you don't want to have an unpaired card, but it, it's tough not to have an unpaired card because nine is, is good enough to call and it's tough to have a three. So you, you just end, end up going with diamonds. And, and then in, in this sense, the ace is the unpaired card. Kind of paradoxically, would you rather have ace of diamonds, 10 of clubs or ace of clubs, 10 of diamonds? 
the ace is not a bluffing card for villain and then you rather have the ten of diamonds and the ten of clubs of course having the ace of diamonds doesn't matter so you go with ace high with a diamond but the ace is not the diamond the other card is a diamond now i know this is like who who cares right but if you if you get the principle right of you want to unblock the folding range and, and you guys could see i knew this principle i was looking for a pair my brain's a bit slow today so i didn't make the jump to okay ace or pair is good and but you don't want the ace of diamonds if we look here with a solver ace of diamonds with a high kicker is not check raising but a non ace of diamonds with a high kicker is check raising a lot like you much rather the other card be the diamond it's very important for like picking your check raise bluffs Okay, so back to the hand. Now understand this theory. Hopefully you guys can apply it to other situations where when you look to make a big check raise bluff on the river, you think a bit about blocking the nuts, but since the calling range, especially in these like bet check bet, the discontinued aggression lines is not about the nuts. We're more thinking about on blocking folds. And that means that we want our cards to be paired or an ace or, you know, a flush card. So in this instance, Victor does call. Isaac Haxton shows up with Ace of Diamonds, Jack of Clubs, which in the instance before was a mistake and BVB completely different spot. But if you guys follow the logic, it's clear it's the same type of mistake here. Jack of Clubs is a bad card to hold. You want to have Jack of Diamonds, Ace of Clubs. You can trace all of your Ace Highs because you have Ace 10, Ace Jack, maybe Ace 8, maybe Ace Queen. Ike, if you're watching this video, now you know. Don't, don't do this. You punted off 200k, man. Come on. It's a small mistake, but these mistakes add up. Like poker is a, a battle of small mistakes. You guys see the huge pots, but in the end, the win rate is just adding up tons and tons of small mistakes. And, and this is a mistake. It's, it's at least one big blind worth of a mistake, which is large in, in the context of your win rate. Victor shows up with a, the kind of fuck you hand, a king eight off, where he's like, you know, I don't even need to have a diamond. I'll just call you with king eight. It's just a bluff catcher. Now, you're supposed to call some bluff catchers. Would you rather have a diamond in your hand? Yes. Does it matter very much? Let's say we check shop. You guys can see solver is indifferent between having or not having a diamond. Doesn't really matter too much. Because like we said, uh, first of all, the check raising range is not all flushes. Second, the bluffing range is try to have diamonds. So these things kind of even out. And eight of hearts uh, is, say you had king jack of clubs, you really don't want to have the jack of clubs. But once it's a low eight, uh, which interacts differently with your opponent's range, it's just less important. So victor's play is, it looks loose, it looks crazy, but what actually happens here is, uh, you know, either the guy has some RNG where he randomizes his decision because he wants to try to play balance, or he has a read, he has a time and tell, or a read about Ike, like he thinks Ike loves going for these river check raises. Or maybe Ike, you know, would go smaller if he had it, or, or stuff like this. Now we're all human, don't think that these guys are machines. We already saw Ike make a, a strategy mistake, he's not understanding the concept correctly. Of course you can have reads these guys play along. I think pretty cool hand to examine, there's a nice concept. Uh, hidden in there and you can take this concept and apply it across the board whenever you're in a river situation you're thinking do i want to check raise bluff or not if you ask me i'd ask first of all do you have reads this is worth one big blind in theory but if you have if you think your opponent's just gonna fold because you know you have a good image and this guy hates making hero calls and he keeps showing face up when he folds or if he's on monster tilt meltdown and you know, there's a big chance he's just going to tilt call it. You need to be careful. Like, that, that that should always be your number one priority. But beyond that, with no information, there is this one or two big blinds extra you can win per hand by being aware of blockers uh, to value range versus blockers to bluffing range and thinking about unblocking the bluffing range in these kind of river bluffing scenarios. That's it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it was only one hand and some solver mixed in. I'm not sure personally do you guys like the solver or not because I could explain these things without having the solver in the background as well. I think the important thing to understand is the logic behind what the solver is doing. Otherwise, just looking at is this combo good or bad is not very useful. But once you understand the logic like we did in this video, you can apply it across the board. Tell your friends, tell Ike Axton, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank <laughs> you.